Hallelujah. The message for today is titled, The Lord Needs You. The Lord Needs You. Our Bible text is Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 3. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 3. And when they drew near to Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village over against you, and straight away you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if any man says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And straight away he will send them. And if any man says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. Brethren, the Lord has need of you. Today, we want to refocus ourselves about life. As Christians, as children of God, we want to give ourselves new focus and see life for what life truly is. Uh, when we do spiritual mapping, one of the things that we are taught is to see our environment the way our environment is, not the way our environment appears to be. It is possible, as a result of spiritual manipulation, for a man or a woman to see his environment not as the way it is, but the way some forces have determined it to look like. And it is possible for a man or a woman also to see his life not the way it is, but the way it has been made to appear to be. We want to see life the way it is, not the way it appears to be. We grew up with a focus, with a vision about life. A focus that was determined primarily by our family, by our society, and by our culture. Oftentimes, the vision that we are given about life is not the way life is. It is the way our family has interpreted it, the way our society and our culture have interpreted it. At the second Sunday of this year, we did a teaching on biblical worldview. And we explained some of these things in that teaching. That your worldview is determined by your family, your society, but you need to develop a biblical worldview. So what we are going to be talking about today is in line with having a biblical worldview. And biblical worldview simply says the Lord 
needs you. As Christians, we need to align our lives with God's purpose. The modern gospel, which many of us have been exposed to, the modern gospel that teaches prosperity, the well-being of man, the success of man, the comfort of man, the popularity of man, that modern gospel aligns with secularity. It places man first. The true gospel places Jesus first. Now, we must renew our mind. We must develop a biblical worldview that places Jesus first. That Jesus comes first. And when we place Jesus first, we discover that every life, Jesus needs you. You are not ordinary. You are supernatural. Everyone that is in Christ, you are not ordinary. You are supernatural. There is something about you that is not in the person sitting beside you or standing beside you. There is nothing about you. Uh, the, there is something about you, rather, that is unique to you alone. And on account of that, the Lord needs you for a specific thing, a unique assignment. The donkey was needed for a unique assignment to carry the king of glory triumphantly into Jerusalem. If the Lord needed a donkey, the Lord needs you. Christianity is a life of exchange. You will remember when we were doing the teaching on how to overcome sin, we mentioned about substitution. That on the cross, God substituted Christ for us. He exchanged Christ for us. We were the ones supposed to be crucified. But there was an exchange. God put Christ there. We were the ones supposed to pay for our sin. There was an exchange. Christ was made to pay for our sin. In our own lives also, that exchange also takes place. Whatever purpose you have, whatever goal you have, it is to be exchanged for that of Christ. If you accept the life of Christ, then you must give your own life to Christ. It is an exchange. You cannot accept the life of Christ and still hold on to your own. If you accept the life of Christ, then you must surrender to the purpose of Christ. It is an exchange. Christianity is a life of exchange. Jesus comes first. The Lord is priority. His will, his purpose must come first in your life. If his purpose does not come first in your life, then there is no way you can claim his salvation till the end. It's not possible. 
It's not possible because such individual will now be living in disobedience. If you say Jesus is Lord, then you must surrender to his lordship. He comes first. That's why Jesus asked in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? If you call him Lord, if you call him your master, then you must obey him. And if your master says, I want to use you for this purpose, you have no right to object because he is your master. You have acknowledged he is your Lord. When we refer to the Lord, we call him our Lord and Savior. If he is not your Lord, he cannot be your Savior. We must renew our minds as Christians. We must separate ourselves from the rebellion of this age, the spirit of rebellion that has even entered the church, that people come to church, they want to use Jesus. They want to use God to actualize their own programs, their plans, and their objectives. And they are not willing to allow God to tamper with their own program. It is the spirit of rebellion. Whoever lives by that spirit cannot call Jesus Savior because he has rejected him as Lord. Luke chapter 14, verses 26 to 33. Luke chapter 14, verses 26 to 33. I will try and read it very quickly. Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life too. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, Sit not down first and count the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it. Least happily, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sits not down first? and consults whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an ambassage and, de and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Anyone, whosoever he be, that forsakes not all that he has, including his plans, including his programs, including his purpose, he cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ. The Preachers of the modern gospel have done terrible damage to the church. Terrible damage that only God can correct and reverse it. Because they have presented to men a self-centered gospel. A gospel that places man first, 
are now put Jesus Christ in the position of facilitator. That all that Jesus is existing for is to do what man wants. And man has no obligation to do what God wants. That is why when you call prayer meeting, you really find Christians turning up. When you give a call for evangelism, you really find Christians showing up. When you talk about missions, Christians avoid you. When you talk about giving to the work of God, Christians, they withdraw. But they are eager to give to build cathedral. They are eager to give for special programs that excite them. Because the gospel that is being preached in most Christian assemblies is a man-centered gospel. It is not Christ-centered gospel. The truth of the matter is that Jesus needs you. Christ needs you for a specific purpose, for a specific assignment, and you must prepare your mind that whenever the Lord calls, you must surrender. Whenever the Lord calls you, not man, the Lord, you will know when he calls. You must surrender. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your efforts following a man-centered gospel. It will not profit you. It will not profit you. Because God will only reward what he asks you to do. Forget all these things, all the promises they are making in some churches about blessings, about prosperity. Forget it. A lot of Christians have become frustrated. That's why you really find a difference between Christian and non-believer when it comes to collecting bribe, in doing corruption, in cheating, in stealing, in greed. You really find difference between many Christians and unbelievers. Because the promises they have made for them, promises they have made to them, rather in the church, that they will get blessed, did not come to pass. So they are now helping themselves the way unbelievers help themselves. Why? Because they are not serving the Lord. The Lord will only reward what he asks you to do. The Lord will only anoint what he has given you to do. The Lord will only support you when you are doing what he has asked you to do. God will not reward what he did not send you. God will not fight for you where he did not send you. God will not give you anointing to do what he has not called you to do. You must discover what the Lord has called you to do. The Lord needs you. So every Christian, you must count the cost. Are you willing to be a disciple of Jesus or not? The master says, count the cost. Because it will cost you your own program, your own plans. You must accept that of the Lord. The purpose of the world, the world system is to turn man away from fulfilling the purpose of God. Satan has sown fear in the heart, in the mind of many Christians. Fear that, look, 
If you serve Jesus, if you give your life to Jesus, if you surrender your plans to Jesus, you will suffer. Hey, you want to go and serve Jesus, you will suffer. Particularly, they will use missions to put fear inside of you. You want to go to a mission field, you have signed a contract with poverty. You will be wearing hand-me-down clothing. You won't have money. You will be drinking muddy water. They, they put that fear so people are afraid. Many Christians run away from serving the Lord. It is deliberate. Many Christians are afraid to commit themselves fully to the Lord because of the fear that ah, if you commit yourself fully to the Lord, you are taking this Christianity too serious. So you are taking it too serious. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. When your suffering starts, don't come near me. Oh. Don't ask me for anything. They put that fear. And as we shared the first message we shared this year, you know, that was what we started with. And I shared the illustration of a man who said he doesn't want to give his, surrender his life and his time and everything to the Lord because uh, he's afraid that if he should, Surrender. God will just make him suffer. And Watchmani answered him, Do you take God to be a wicked father? That if his son should obey him, he will make him suffer. And that's what is in the mind of many of us, even as you are hearing me this morning. At the back of your mind is that fear. If I go too deep in this Christianity, I'm going to suffer. So, because of that fear, a lot of Christians who know what God wants them to do, they refuse to do it and they run away. The danger is this. Once you run away from Christ... You run straight into the arms of Satan. It's as simple as ABC. There is no, no other place that you run into. Once you run away from Jesus Christ, you are running straight into the hands of a demon. You cannot run away from Jesus and run into the arms of Angel Michael. It's not possible. You cannot run away from Jesus and run into the arms, into the comfort of the Holy Ghost. It's not possible. Once you run from Jesus, you run straight into the arms of Lucifer. And Lucifer is the person who is ready to make you suffer. The Lord needs you. It's the only reason why he called you is for glory. Not to punish you, not to make you suffer. So as a Christian, renew your mind. There is no fear in seeking the purpose of God. The reason you are created is for a purpose. The time will come when the Lord will call you. That is if he has not called you. But the time will come, the Lord will call you and say, we are ready for you now. We need you in this season. That is why you were born in this generation. That is why you were not born in the days of your grandfather. You could have been born in the days of Mongo Park. You could have been born in the days of King Herod. You could have been born in the days of Caesar. You could have been born in the days of Apostle Paul. But God did not need you in those dispensations. He needs you in this generation. There is a specific thing that God wants to do 
in this generation that you alone is the person that can do it. You alone. So stop running. Stop running. Because if you run away from Jesus, that you don't want to do what Jesus has called you to do, as we mentioned a few seconds or a few minutes ago, you are running straight into the arms of Satan. Nobody runs from Jesus and falls into the arms of God. It's not possible. The purpose of God in your life is the reason why you were created. The purpose of God in your life. When you discover God's purpose in your life, that is when you achieve fulfillment. A lot of people are saying they are not fulfilled. You cannot be fulfilled because you have not discovered purpose. You can only attain fulfillment in your life when you discover the purpose for which God created you. That is when everything falls into place. That is when you understand why you were put into Nigeria and God did not put you into Russia. You could have been born in Russia. You could have been born in India. You did not choose your nationality. You did not choose your mother. You did not choose your father. You did not choose your tribe. You did not choose the day you arrived on planet Earth. All those decisions were taken by God for a purpose. When the time comes, when heaven knocks on the door of your heart that it is time, don't be afraid. It is for this purpose you were created. Apostle Paul explains it in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verses 12 to 14. Philippians 3, verses 12 to 14. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Apostle Paul says, I follow after, if that I may lay hold, apprehend means to lay hold, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ also laid hold on me. Say, Christ grabbed me for one purpose, and I am also trying to grab that thing for which Christ grabbed me, laid hold on me. If I may apprehend it. Brethren, there is a reason why God in Christ apprehended you. If Christ had not apprehended you, you will not be here today listening to this message. It won't make sense to you. There are a thousand and one things that you could be doing at this time. But you left every other thing, you are listening to this message. Why? Because Christ laid hold on you. You are a Christian because Christ laid hold on you. 
second Peter describes it as an election. Make your calling an election sure. There was a day a vote was cast in heaven. We don't know when in eternity past because known unto God are all his works from eternity past. But there was a day there was a vote and your name was mentioned even before you were formed in your mother's womb. And God looked at Jesus and said, how do you vote? And Jesus says, I vote eternal life for him. That's why you are born again. It's not because you are nice. It's not because you are smart. It's not because you have a good conscience. There was an election. And Jesus voted life, eternal life for you. And that eternal life, you will do something for God. A lot of people, when they arrive on planet Earth, they forget the purpose and they start pursuing money. I'm talking now about those who are even inside the church. They forget purpose. They start pursuing money. Some start pursuing fame. Some start pursuing success. And they forget it's about eternal life. There was an election. And the word of God says, make your calling and election sure. Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. Your obedience must be perfect. Therefore, your prayer must change. Your prayer, it must change. The best prayer that you can pray as a Christian, it's not to ask God to bless you. No. In fact, any Christian who is praying and asking God to bless him is either still a baby Christian or an ignorant one. Why should you ask God to bless you? Why? Why are you asking God for what you already have? Huh? The word of God says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. God has blessed you. God is not going to bless you. You are already blessed. Your prayer must change. Before we see that prayer, let us quickly open to Genesis. Genesis chapter 15. And compare and see the difference between the prayer of the Old Testament saint, which is what a lot of Christians are praying today, and you compare it with the prayer of the New Testament saint, which a lot of New Testament saints are not praying today. Genesis chapter 15, verse 2. I read verse 1 there so that we can have a good background. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. God appeared to Abraham. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? That's the prayer of Abraham. Lord, what will you give me? And that prayer is the prayer of many people in the church today. And that is the prayer a lot of pastors encourage. That's why they tell you, come and serve. If you serve God, God will bless you. Come and serve. Come and give. If you give, God will give back to you. Attend. If you attend, God will meet you at your point of need. It is 
Lord, what will you give me? It's an Old Testament saint. Old Testament saint prayer. Let's go to Acts chapter 9, verses 3 to 6, and see the New Testament saint. The same situation. God appeared to Abraham. God, Jesus, appeared to Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 9, verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you, are pers whom you persecute. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me to do? You see the difference? Lord, what will you have me to do? New Testament says, Old Testament saint, Lord, what will you give me? Give, 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 give. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Give me blessing. Give me prosperity. Give me house. Give me car. Give me money. Uh, give me wife. Give me fruit of the womb. Give me good health. Give me promotion. Uh, give me breakthrough. Give me, give me, give me. Give. That's Old Testament saint prayer. That's what is going on in many churches today. The prayer of a Christian, Lord, what do you want me to do? What is my assignment? You wake up in the morning, the prayer you pray for the day is, Almighty God, what do you want me to do today? What is my assignment for today? Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do? Because the Lord needs you. It is because many Christians are not offering themselves for the Lord. That is why the world is upside down. They go to church, but they refuse to do what the Lord wants. Can you imagine with the number of people who are in churches in Nigeria? Nigeria is only known for corruption. Why? There are Christians in the National Assembly. There are Christians in the presidency. There are Christians in the police. There are Christians in the army. There are Christians in the customs. Have they made any impact upon the country? No. No, because they are not doing what the Lord wants. And the Churches that they go, they don't tell them to do what the Lord wants. They tell them to pray like Abraham in the Old Testament. Give me, Lord, what will you give me? New Testament saint prays, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? And the Lord says, this is your assignment. And you say, consider it done. So long as I have life, that place, don't worry yourself about it anymore. Consider it done. I am there. Which one do you pray, brethren? But I want to encourage you, the one that you should pray. Pray the New Testament prayer. In closing, don't go through life seeking honor. Go through life serving God. A lot of Christians are consumed with becoming famous, successful. That is why you will, you will hear in most churches, my glory, my glory, the prayers they pray. Every enemy of my destiny, every enemy of my destiny, whoever wants to steal my glory, my glory, my glory, you are wasting your time. John chapter 12 verse 26, we close with that. John chapter 12 Verse 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me. 
And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Honor is looking for you. You are not the one looking for honor. If you can yield and accept that the Lord needs you, if you yield and you do the will of God, God will honor you. It is a promise of God. In your generation, God will give you honor. But first, you must accept that the Lord needs you. And having accepted that the Lord needs you, you must surrender yourself to do the will of God. When you yield your life, honor will come. It is the promise of God. The person speaking, his name is the truth. He does not lie. Honor will come. More than you expect. Greatness will come. More than you believe. The problem is, man does not want to surrender. This morning, I'm encouraging you by the word of God, surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord needs you. Let your life be useful to the Lord in your generation. May we bow our heads in prayer.